about their experiences in academia. So it's, it's a big part of our uh, of role as a society to uh, to support people coming here. In Brazil is a lot, so we find this a lot very important. Very thank you for coming here today. Uh, and so we're going to start with a brief presentation from them. Brief presentation. <laughs> And then we are going to move uh, for questions, and then uh, people on Zoom can use the chat at any time during this. And Lila is going to read your questions. Uh, so to start with, um, Mara Nogueira is a lecturer in urban geography and director of the MBA Cities program at Perfect. She works on the cross-class politics of urban space production with an emphasis on the reproduction of social spatial inequalities in urban Brazil. So we can start by. Thank you for your willing to this. Um, so start by thank you, thanking you, Beatriz, and also Larissa, who's not here, but, uh, for the invite, and also the Cambridge University um, uh, Brazilian Society as well for inviting me to be here to be here today and and tell you a bit about my experience uh, in academia in the UK. Um, so I, I would like to start by telling you a bit about my trajectory up until the point. Of today, so I was born in 1985. I'm joking, <laughs> uh, but now you know my age. Uh, anyways, um, so um, I, as as um, Beatriz was saying, I'm in geography nowadays. So I work in a department of geography, but my sort of academic trajectory started in economics, um, which is like my dark secret. <laughs> um, I studied at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, or Wefemiche, for the proceedings out there. Uh, I did both my undergraduate and my master's in, at the Wefemiche. And, um, you know, I was asked to sort of talk a bit about challenges, opportunities of my career. And I think like the first big opportunity that I had was the fact that I've studied in a very good public school in Brazil. And before that, I also studied all my life in public schools. So I think that the existence of that system in Brazil was my first opportunity. Let's say I did my master's with uh, a scholarship from Brazil, which is for those here in the UK, it's very hard to do so. You normally have to pay for your master's, pay for your undergrad. So all those, those barriers were not there for me in my education in Brazil. So I think that's the first big opportunity as a Brazilian that, that we have. Um, so I applied for my for my PhD once I finished my my master's and I wanted to sort of um, have the experience of live abroad, live, in, live abroad. Uh, I've never been to the UK before applying for the for the for the PhD here. I was supported by my supervisor, my master's supervisor who had done his his PhD at UCL. And that's another big opportunity that I had with the existence of those pre-existing networks that allowed me to have the expertise to apply for a PhD. Uh, uh, so that also shows the importance of networks, which is a point that I want to talk about later on as well. Um, so then I started my PhD in 2013 at the LSC. Um, uh, I didn't know anyone before starting. Um, I, I got again supported by an important policy, which is now uh, not as strong as used to be in my time, which was a PhD scholarship for Brazil, um, which was a great scholarship, but has its shortcomings that I can speak of later on if people want to hear about that. So I did my PhD at LSC in human geography and urban studies. And then my challenges kind of begun because I was moving countries, I was moving languages and I was moving disciplines, right? So uh, that's not uncommon for people coming from a different um, background to both kind of like have to readapt to a different environment in academia, uh, which is not just about the language, it's about a different system that you need to learn how to navigate. Uh, and I'm gonna expand on that in a bit. Uh, for my PhD, for those interested, I studied some the urban conflicts created or sort of exacerbated by projects associated with the hosting of the World Cup in Belo Horizonte. So where I used to live before, so that, you know, there were, there was something, um, I have a, a facility in terms of doing my PhD because I knew the context 
And I think there's an increasing interest in, in, in uh, places beyond the UK uh, in terms of like people with expertise to do research on, on, on different areas, especially the so-called global south. So I think that was, uh, um, you know, coming to the UK, but with that knowledge from, from Brazil. And Brazil is a country that always attracts attention, I think. So that's one advantage that we have as Brazilians to come here already with, with that knowledge. Um, after the PhD, I finished my PhD in 2017. Then I went back to Brazil, following some of the obligations of my, of my scholarship. And then that was perhaps the main obstacle that I had. And that kind of like uh, also introduces a sort of topic uh, that's important to talk about, which is by learning how to navigate academia in the UK and to focus your energy on that, you end up not developing networks in Brazil as much. Uh, so if any of you are studying here and would like to return, it's important to kind of like uh, have those networks in place and kind of nurture some networks in Brazil. So when you come back, you have, you know, uh, something to, to rely on. Um, I spent nine months in Brazil looking for a job there, couldn't find one, can talk about that as well in the Q&A if people are interested. And then I applied for a fellowship at my, um, uh, at LSE, and then I got uh, the job. And then I, I, I came back to do this fellowship, which was for a year, and then it could be renewed for, for two more years. And then while doing uh, that fellowship, I applied to other jobs and got my current job at Birkbeck. Um, so yeah, and that's where I am now. So trajectory kind of over. Uh, I want to sort of just elaborate on a few of the challenges that I mentioned, sort of, I mean, it's an obvious challenge that the language is always something that makes it harder for us because um, you have to second guess yourself all the time. You have to, you spend much more time than everyone else to write an email or even to, to write an essay and then to write a paper. So everything takes more time and, and, and that's not, you're not giving more time because of that. So it creates uh, an extra pressure. And when I was saying it's not just about the language, it's about the entire system. So I had colleagues that had been, and I'm sure you do as well, that have been trained in the UK and knew how to navigate the system almost naturally. And it wasn't natural to me, so I had to learn that. And then, then there's the importance of finding good mentors uh, that can help you navigate. And I had, I mean, a very good PhD supervisor who was also not from the UK, um, who knew how to navigate the system, having learned to do so as well as uh, a foreign scholar. So, always very important to recognize who can be a mentor and kind of work together with the, with the people that you think can help you in, in developing your career here. And then there's the importance of networks. I talked about that in the context of wanting to go back to Brazil, but there is also uh, the importance of networks for people who uh, want to build careers here, right? A person who was born in the UK, raised here, has friends, has networks that can help them uh, find opportunities, right? That, you know, as theorized <laughs> in social science. But uh, for us, it's like we start building those networks when we sell foods here. Uh, so I think the importance of creating and nurturing networks, and sometimes it's much easier than, than you think your networks are in this room, for instance. It doesn't have to be like the, the professor, uber duber kind of guy. It's your colleague that will go through the same challenge as you, and eventually we end up uh, um, in, a, in a job uh, somewhere and that this person will become a contact for you. So, um, you know, and doing things beyond your degrees as well is important for that because it's through friendships sometimes that you create those networks. So yeah, go to the pub, have a chat with people, <laughs> create those friendships that are important, not only for jobs, but also for, the other point I want to talk about, which is the emotional difficulties of doing a degree and having a career and living in a different country, uh, which is like I moved here by myself. As I said, first time I set foot in London, I moved here. So I had to uh, overcome as well this difficulty of being away from friends and family. 
uh, and that cannot be sort of like understated, right? Um, so the importance of creating those networks as well to support you emotionally in your in your decisions and your choices in life. I would say as a sort of um, tip, find a hobby that you enjoy. For me, it was football as a typical Brazilian. Uh, um, so that helps you also create networks beyond you, what you do for a living. That can be very important to alleviate that mental pressure and stress of, of everyday life, but also uh, to have you know quality of life and, and, and well-being, which is important for everybody. Uh, I'm gonna finish with a few opportunities that I think that are uh, relevant as well. Um, as I said, when I when I came here to do my PhD, I had to navigate a different system. I had to sort of navigate a different language. But the topic of my PhD, I knew better than most people, right? So we come with this knowledge from uh, our, our, our countries. We come from the knowledge that we acquired through our education in Brazil, which is of great, very good quality. And, um, and that is very valuable. Uh, the position that I mean now, for instance, uh, one of the requirements was for someone that works on uh, cities in the global south, right? And that is a module that I give today as part of my job. And, you know, having that knowledge that I built from early on in my career was very relevant. I forgot, forgot to mention, for instance, that I did research throughout my whole life in Brazil, not my whole life, my whole academic life. <laughs> I was a very a science, <laughs> child scientist, I'm joking. Um, and those opportunities, I think, are much harder to find here sometimes. So I, I did what they call uh, scientific initiation in Brazil, which has also chief since my uh, first year of my, of my, of my degree. And you know that those opportunities, that building that kind of like research knowledge was very important for me to get to the PhD position and also later on to, to get the job that I have. And nowadays also the links that I have with academia in Brazil are very relevant for my job, for applying for grants, for uh, uh, doing research in Brazil. So um, I am in partnership with researchers in Brazil and sometimes I, I, I find myself mediating the relationship between the, U, the UK academia and the Brazilian system because I have knowledge of both. So that's an asset that most of us have and that uh, can open up uh, opportunities. And I'm sorry if I spoke for too long. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and thank you again for, for the invite. Thank you, Mara. Thank you. Talking about this, uh, like those networks, because that's something that we as the Brazilian society have to think about. Too. Yeah, nice. Um, so, well, so let's move to Heide, who is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Education here in Kansas City. Uh, she teaches in various programs and a lot of her teachings are around science education and the colonial pedagogies. And prior to that, she worked for eight years in secondary and graduate research in Brazil. And then what she was for this. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to talk about my, my whole CV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Beatriz. And thanks, everyone. Um, for being here in person and for being here on Zoom. And thanks uh, to um, Coops for organizing this uh, event. It's always, like Mara said, big part of being an international scholar in the UK is about your networks and not the kind of instrumental YouTube networks. It's, it's because we empower each other and, and those kinds of opportunities are brilliant. And I have a lot to thank these kinds of opportunities in my career as well before I came here. So thank you very much everyone for organizing. And I feel like I might be, you know, I might be a little bit repetitive because I think I realized that we have, to, we have a very similar trajectory, man. so it's gonna be interesting. <laughs> and for the sake of fairness, I'm gonna say that my trajectory started in 1987 and dot, dot, dot. And then, <laughs> um, so um, I was born um, in Campinas, which is considered to be a big town in the state of Sao Paulo, and, and there's a big university town, but not, of course, not medieval as Cambridge, but has this same kind of idea that, you know, have a big university and a, and a, and a town around it. So I was born um, in that town, and I went through the state, uh, the state education sector 
training, doing what here in the UK they would say the A levels, the academic track of, of higher of high school. But I also trained as a food technician, so I did a dual kind of degree, and that led me to become a lab technician even before I actually went to university. So I worked for a while as a lab technician in Brazil. Campinas is a very um, is an area of Brazil that is very um, related to the chemical industry. So I worked in that area for a while. And then I did a chemistry uh, degree at the State University of Campinas, so which stayed in my hometown. Uh, and I did a degree in industrial chemistry, double major, let's say, in industrial chemistry and chemistry education. Uh, and I, I worked exactly like Mara mentioned. I had, I was, when I was at the University in Brazil, the State Public University in Brazil, I had scholarships throughout my whole trajectory there, like scholarships as, as an undergrad student, not because we had to pay fees, like you have to pay here in the UK, but the university was free for me and for a lot of us in Brazil. But I had a scholarship to do research. So I did uh, research in science education and, and industrial, industrial chemistry throughout my whole all my five years of, of my um, bachelor degree. And then I started teaching and working with teachers and working in education through that kind of initial engagement with research first and foremost, not just through doing a degree in teaching in the teacher education, but also by doing research. And that's something that is very, very interesting when we compare Brazil, Brazilian higher education system with the UK higher education system, especially when you look at the public sector in Brazil, where you have scholarships as an undergrad student, not just to not pay your fees, but to actually produce knowledge. So there is this notion of, of us being as producers of knowledge since we are undergrad students. And that's something that is very powerful about the system in Brazil. Mara mentioned that, and I want to second that information because it, it, it allows us to become um, academics from a very early uh, stage of our careers. And, and I'll, I'll mention that later when I talk about my move to the UK, but that was something that my supervisors here in the UK when I came the first time were actually impressed by in that sense of, oh, but if you, you have publications from before doing your PhD, yes, because we have this trajectory as researchers that starts on a much earlier, and we need to embrace that, that kind of what higher education in a country like Brazil can be to us. So I finished my degree as, as, um, as an undergrad student, uh, and I worked, like that they said, for, for around eight years as a chemistry and science teacher in the state sector uh, of, in Sao Paulo, mainly in what here in the UK they would call post-16 post education, basically high school in Brazil, but also technical and vocational schools, because that's my place I like to work with professional professional development. Um, so I taught uh, for, for a long time, for those, long time, those eight years, felt a long time. And um, while I was a full-time teacher, I also did um, another uh, good thing that we have uh, for teachers, specifically in Brazil, in the state of Sao Paulo, there are specific scholarships for master's degree and PhDs for teachers in, the, in that state to do their professional development through masters and PhDs as they are full-time teachers in the classroom. So I was lucky to have uh, that kind of scholarship. And then I did my master's degree in science education with a focus on the colonial science um, as part of why I was teaching in the classroom. Uh, and I did, so I did my master's degree for two years in Brazil in the same university, the University of Campinas. Um, and when I was almost finishing my master's degree, um, for personal reasons, uh, my partner and I, my partner decided to move to the UK to do his PhD here. And I, I'm going to share the personal side of this because it was not necessarily my choice to do my PhD <laughs> in the UK. It was a life decision that he couldn't do his PhD in Brazil because of his field. So he came to the UK to do his PhD at the Institute of Education at UCL. And then I said, well, you are going, then I'm going. I was finishing my master's and said, why not? I wanted to do a PhD. Uh, as a teacher in Brazil, I could have done with a scholarship from the government in Brazil as well. Uh, but then we applied to, to come to the UK. 
and then we got a scholarships. Luckily, the same kind of scholarship that Mara was talking about. I got a scholarship from a program in Brazil that is not existing, it doesn't exist anymore, called Science Without Borders, because I was doing my research in science education and the colonial anti racist science education. So a shout to the program. Um, that was uh, 2015, so after the World Cup uh, in Brazil, the Mara was researching. Uh, so we arrived, I arrived with my partner in 2015. Um, and in that, traject that trajectory of applying and coming to the UK was extremely similar to what Mana said. So I'm not gonna repeat, repeat it a lot, but I had master supervisors, master's professors uh, in my university in Brazil that actually, you know, at that state they had done their postdocs like or oh, internships here in the UK, in the university. So they knew important people in academia, in my field of science education. So there was this existing network through my mentors in Brazil that really allowed me to get in touch with, with the right people, um, not just the right people in terms of finding a spot for me in the university, but finding people who would understand the kind of project and the kind of epistemology kinds of knowledge and concerns that I was bringing to my work as a scholar in science education in the colonial studies, in anti-racist practice from the global south. And I think this is a little bit what, what I wanted to just flag for everyone who is an international scholar going to any other country, is, is, is this, this notion that sometimes the knowledge that you bring uh, or the epistemologies, the theories, the theoretical backgrounds and frameworks that you bring to your project are not familiar to the people in the global north or to the people in the UK or to the people in any country. We, of course, people don't know everything about everything. So you have to find, when you are making that kind of move, it's very important to find the right people to work with. My PhD supervisors, they work, work like British supervisors. I was bringing a lot of the colonial studies from the global south, a lot of anti-racist comments in a field that is traditionally very, very conservative, which is science and science education. But they were amazing supervisors there. I knew that because I had other, I had my mentors in Brazil who knew them and they said they are the right people because they might not know what you know. And like Mara said, we know our about our PhD topics a lot more than other people will know. But if you find the right supervisors, those supervisors who are open to learn from you, that's, that's the kind of experience that really pays off for us moving from a, one epistemological tradition, one research tradition to another. So I had, I was lucky enough to have those networks that helped me identify the right people to receive me here and to accept me for what I was, a, a, the colonial science educator from the global south, wanting to do that kind of project with teachers in England, because my project was with schools in England. So I needed to bring a lot of those theories to my practice here, and I needed a lot of support in talking to those people who might not know a lot about what I'm talking about anyways. And, and, and that, that network, though, that mentoring that we get uh, from our home universities, from our, from our support system in our home campus can be extremely helpful to find the right people when you make the move. So like I mentioned, I came in 2015 and my work was actually bringing those the colonial ideas that I was already involved with uh, as, a, as a teacher in Brazil to the teachers in England. And I think that one, that, that was my main obstacle to contrary to, to Mara's experience because she, she did her work in Brazil, I did my work here. So I am a teacher, I know classrooms. I don't know the UK system. I didn't know the UK system. I didn't know any teachers in the UK that I could call and say, can I come to your classroom and do some work with your students? Which is something that we would do in Brazil. If, if I were doing, I was doing that kind of project in Brazil, I would just, you know, call my colleagues and come to their schools. And which is something that people who are from the UK do all the time when they are doing their projects. So in that sense, when I arrived with this crazy project uh, that my supervisors were happy for me to do, but not knowing anyone to help me do that, then the networks here in the UK then became extremely important. And there's net networks like this, you know, knowing the right people, having, have, you know, meeting the PhD students in the years above me who were doing things in schools in England and, and could put me in touch with the right people, talking to the 
teacher educators in my university, I am like I am now. And so do you do you work in any schools that might be interested? And that kind of network early on in my project really paid off because then I couldn't I could I learned about the UK system just by talking to those people, just by following them around and going with them to schools and talking to people. So I think there is a level of putting yourself out there that comes with being a, an international scholar, whenever in any country you are, of course, that I cannot emphasize enough. Um, then I did my PhD, and I, I, again, second everything that Mara said, I think the most important part of my PhD was developing not just the network with those right people, but networks of like-minded scholars, like the ones you have here. The best conversations, the best intellectual conversations I had or with other PhD students from Chile, or other PhD students from India, other PhD students from Africa, other PhD students from the UK, PhD students from Hong Kong. That, that was the part of, of my PhD experience that really made me a good researcher because I was not just learning about the UK system. Part of my, my work was to learn about the international landscape of education by talking to those other people coming from with that amazing background for, from all over the world and exchanging. I can talk a little bit about the Chile's uh, system because I've heard so much about it from my colleagues. I can talk a little bit about how things work in India because I've heard so much about that from my colleagues. So those exchanges really make you a good scholar. You might not be the expert on all those things, but you'll know how to talk to people. That intercultural um, skill that you develop in being an international scholar is extremely interesting and I think extremely valuable. And I think that that's what, I mean, to finish and not take too much of your time, I think that that pays off when you are applying for jobs. Like Mara said, you know, you know you are expert in one thing, but you also know how to talk to people about several different things in terms of inter intercultural knowledge. And I think we need to embrace that. And it can be very daunting being an international scholar because you have to learn a lot about how to navigate academia in a different country, like Mana said. Things work very differently here in terms of applying for jobs. For instance, in Brazil, it's a lot more bureaucratic. It takes less months. Here is like two days and that's it. Very, very different. You have to learn all of that. It seems like a hindrance. But you also, we also bring so much with us about other things that we can put out there. And you know, going back to social sciences and theories like Bourdieu, you talk about cultural capital and social capital. We can bring a lot of that with us um, to, let's say, make up for the things that we might feel that we are lacking. And we might be lacking that knowledge of the hidden curriculum of higher education in the UK because we don't know how to navigate. But we know a lot more about other things that we can, uh, bank on uh, when we are we can capitalize to keep on with it we can capitalize on when we are applying for jobs here and those networks that we have in brazil those networks that you have in your home countries they really look well look nice in the cv when you are applying for jobs you know you are showing that you have you have processes of internationalization of higher education in this country massively so that really really looks nice in your cv as well so embracing that side can be extremely helpful so I finished my PhD um, in 2019. Uh, keep an eye on the, on the timeline. I finished in 2019. And then I stayed at the UCL Institute of Education where I did my PhD. I stayed there as a research fellow. It's not, it's not like a postdoc, it's more like a permanent position for as a researcher. Not very common in Brazil, actually. There's, there was no teaching involved, but there's researching for a research center they have there. And I stayed researching what is my expertise, teachers work, teachers autonomy, teachers professionalism, teachers, especially in my case, teachers who are radicals in the classroom. Um, and I stayed for an year, amazing group, but I, I missed the classroom. It was just a research post and I missed being a teacher. So I was looking for posts that had both teaching and researching. And then I applied to this university, to this faculty in April, 2020 which is basically the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so I went through the whole process of applying for the job and interviewing and getting the job in the middle of the pandemic, uh, which in itself is very interesting to navigate. And then I started here in uh, September 2020. 
uh, and I, I, I don't know, we don't, we don't know that, but I feel like a lot of the things that made me arrive where I am in this university, in this you know, very famous university, is all the things that I could show for that came with my trajectory, uh, having been a researcher of education since my undergrad, having publications and having those networks and having that experience, not just in the classroom, but an experience in the classroom in another country so I could bring another perspective of the educational practice to the practice of education here. I, I, I train teachers in this university and I, I, but I, I was never a teacher in this country. So I bring other perspectives of the ways of being a teacher to the program. And I think that was something that perhaps convinced them that I was a good, a good hire for this job, like bringing other perspectives into a field. So I think that level of interculturality that we bring with us in inter as international scholars is really what brought me to where I am. Is that all right? Yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. It's very difficult to talk about that. Uh, we see just uh, the fact that we don't know the system that well, and I actually came on today's as well in the short term. You know, and it's not, it's not just to, to say that, you know, it's not a challenge, it is yeah. a challenge. But I think it's nice when we look at ourselves as people who have a lot to bring and not just a lot to fear. Mm -hmm. So, uh, ask if there was a system for new overseas academics to get research grants in CU, I assume it's Cambridge. Um, I study engineering for context if it's important. Thank you. And the topic is very important. Thank you. Well, from a Cambridge perspective, uh, I I haven't heard about anything like it, like networks and systems for early career researchers, for early career academics in the university. Uh, we have, depending on the department you are, there are different ways of going about that. So we have, for instance, in the faculty, specific funding that is protected for people who are new to the job and new to the career. So that, that's something, but not specifically to international. It's not, it doesn't depend on you being international. I've never heard about anything that is related to a uh, support system. I mean, we have HR and that kind of support system in terms of visa, finding your place in the university, finding your place around Cambridge, but nothing specific like that from what I have been told. And if there is, I miss not on that kind of information and I should know more about it. But I, I think it's more on the early career level angle that there are some specific, uh, not just support networks, but also financial support as well. Does that answer the question? Perhaps. Uh, is, is, there, is there anything yeah. more back for international scholars specifically? I'm, I'm not, I mean, in my field, which is not his <laughs> or her, sorry. Um, um, there is a kind of like the Urban Foundation, for instance, um, Urban Studies Foundation has a, a scholarship which is for scholars in the Global South. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think it wouldn't be uncommon to have those kinds of scholarships, but they are not going to be provided at the university level, but perhaps at this kind of more foundation wow. level. So I would check the British, the British um, Academy, Levy Hume, uh, those types of foundations that, that provide for research. Um, which might have something focused on, on, on international schools specifically, but not at, I don't think, not the university. That's a very good point. And you know, for Brazilians, for instance, the British Academy and the Newton Fund, they mm -hmm. often come together um, to mm -hmm. put things in, and that not just for Brazil, a lot of global South countries, but that would be at the level of the funder, some specific mm -hmm. initiatives to attract international scholars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, I mean, just to expand a bit on that, that's a kind of like, <clears throat> not a difference, but it's something that you have to find out and how to navigate in the UK, which is like to understand who the founders are and which kinds of scholarship they have and, you know, how it works, you know, you have all those kinds of different funders and they have their own rules, they have their own schemes, 
and and to have the knowledge of that kind of landscape is is, is important. So I, I think that that would be my kind of advice for for the person to kind of like familiarize themselves with the the funding landscape in the UK if they want to come here. And if they are already here, for instance, for those who are PhD students here and then want to stay, most universities, I know Cambridge has, and even departments in universities, they have not just the careers advice side, but they also have the research advice side. So they have some research advice uh, people here in the faculty, we have a person, two people who are responsible for, for organizing and giving advice on research applications. So mm -hmm. if you are a PhD student here, you can look for those people as well in your department or in your university to ask for, for support, you know, learning a little bit more mm -hmm. about the landscape for funding. So it's not just careers advice, but also funding and advice. And then if you are here, that, that's a good opportunity to, to use. Um, yeah, and, and, when, and when you do, <clears throat> you can, I mean, if, if you do want to do research here as well, you can approach someone who is a faculty member in a university and, and, and propose something and work on a grant application together. And then yes. someone like the person that I was talking about will come in and support the, the application process. And all departments, all universities will have someone like that. So I, I, yeah. there are ways, but it's not straightforward as, as it seems sometimes. And when in doubt, if you have the network, if you know people who are here, ask yes. I think I asked a lot of things and I, I wasn't ashamed of asking just ask ask your supervisor is there anyone who can explain to me yeah. maybe your supervisor or the person you know is not available to explain because it's very complicated but they know people in their departments mm -hmm. that you know or web websites where you can go to look at more information about that yeah, I think it's interesting on that note because sometimes I get emails from people who want to research something that's similar to what I do uh -huh. asking about funding and things like that and then when people are like people are always so nice and polite that they just answer them because i don't mind doing that yeah. i think other people also would uncomfortably this is the thing about just putting yourself out there and like, just trying to email it's not going really to happen anything but yeah and then, they have, and then the amount of people you meet like that and then they become potential partners yeah. you know if things play play out and, and go well they can you know can become visiting yeah. scholars at some point you can establish those with internet and everything being online nowadays, those yeah. kinds of networks, we actually, even that kind of initial contact, just asking for help. I'm sure some of you uh, might have, you know, sent an email to, to, to someone in an university. Oh, you are a Brazilian student there. Can you tell me a little bit about how, how to navigate? That kind of thing, can, you can keep doing that when you're thinking yeah. about applying to, you know, for funding, applying, you know, ask other people. That's, a, you know, it helps. It helps to make things visible because there are a lot of hidden stuff in the system. And I think especially in the UK, but compared to Brazil and other countries, where, for instance, in Brazil, we have very clear funders and streamlined places to go. Here, there are so many, because there are some that are kind of private nature and not necessarily state-based nature. So there are so many possibilities that it is a lot more difficult, at least for me, to kind of map everywhere you can go. And, and so many different calls and different opportunities uh, all the time. So it's good to, to have people to ask you and know where to go if you want more information. Yeah, too, I believe that. Great answer. <laughs> we have two other questions, and I'll read them together because I think the first one is very straightforward. So, Roberta asks you, Maya, if you accept many students for the decoding studies course. <laughs> <laughs> Tell her to I send me an email. Roberta sent her an email. Um, <laughs> Mateus uh, says, uh, Thanks for this great talk. I have a question about the hiring process in the UK. How is the faculty recruitment process? What happens after you submit an application? Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I, I can speak about it, but I think it's going to be very similar. Like, uh, uh, you know, there's a there's the call, and then the university will receive like uh, all the CVs and cover letters. Normally, that's all you have to submit for for an application. So, as Nada was saying, it's very straightforward in comparison to Brazil. You don't have to attach all your diplomas and certificates of everything you've ever done in your life to prove that your CV is true. 
they will believe you. Uh, yeah. For those uh, who are not Brazilian listening yeah. to this, in Brazil, our hiring processes, they ask, so when you go to a conference, you need to get a certificate, and then you keep, you need to keep that archive of yeah. all the certificates you've ever had in your life as a package, and you need to copy everything and send in as part of your Via the Pope, it has to be on the Pope. Like that. Um, so here it's not like that. You know, like that. You, you prepare your CV and then normally you have a reference and I suppose they rely on the references to confirm the things that you that you've um, uh, said that you've done in your, your, your CV. Um, and then it goes for a short listing process. Normally you have a hiring committee which will do the short listing process. And because I mean for most jobs they will receive like a lot of applications it's going to be very straightforward in terms of like does this person meet the the criteria right like do they have you know there will be like a ticking box exercise mm -hmm. and then on that exercise you get rid of like a bunch of people and then you start getting pickier and selecting the people that might have publications that you consider good and so on so on so forth and then you end up with normally i would say five six candidates tops and those candidates are invited for, for an interview process that can vary. I, I can't do a few in my, my lifetime so far. They, they, um, they can be quite straightforward in terms of like the, the job that I got, for instance. There were five people who were um, uh, shortlisted. And then as part of the process, you also have to submit a writing sample, which generally speaking would be a paper that you've published somewhere. Um, and then you will give a presentation generally, which they will pr provide with some sort of like uh, 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 structure for that. I'll present 25 minutes on your research plans plus 25 minutes on your um, um, teaching approach to this topic and so on and so forth. So it varies, but in general, is that process of doing a presentation in which you're going to present to the department, so that includes the hiring committee, but also other members of the department who uh, can give their opinions about the people, but the opinions who actually count are the ones in the hiring committee. So as a faculty at Birkbeck, I've been part of also the selection process, and you say like, after everyone presented, you say like, oh, I think this person is this and that, but you know, at the end of the day, the interview with the hiring committee will be the, the, the next step that will kind of like define uh, who gets hired. Um, and in, generally speaking, like in my, my experience, you know, there is a fit with the department that people are looking for, someone that, you know, um, that can bring something new to the table, but can also work together with the people in the department. Um, obviously someone with a good record of like publications and things like that, that, you know, show that you can perform at that level kind of thing. Grants, if you have one, <laughs> great. That's, that's increasingly important in this country that you can sort of show your ability to sort of, um, um, you know, get great money. money. <laughs> um, so uh, those are things that I think are, are relevant in the hiring process and obviously kind of doing a good interview. I've, I've been through interviews in which you, you're talking to three people and it's kind of pretty straightforward. I've been to an interview where I was interviewed simultaneously by seven people and felt like the most overwhelming moment of my life. I did not get that job. <laughs> <laughs> you got the, be the better. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, you know, the important thing is uh, to make sure that when you're applying for a job, that you spend some time studying the department that you're applying for, because it shows when you're applying for something and you have no idea what the job is about. Uh, one tip that I was given and I thought was <clears throat> important is like get in touch with the person. Normally a job advert will have a contact name. Uh, send them an email and be like, oh, I'm interested in that job. Can we have a conversation? Uh, sometimes they would say, sorry, no, but I'm not doing that because I have too many applications. But sometimes they'll say yes. And then in that conversation, you show one, that you're very keen. And second, you learn a bit more about the job that you're applying to. Mm -hmm. So if that is something available, I really recommend doing that. Uh, and yes, 
ensure that your cover letter kind of like is tailored for the job that you're applying to. Obviously, some bits and pieces are going to be very straightforwardly kind of like equal. And because, you know, your trajectory is going to be always your trajectory, but make sure that you're tailoring your, your cover letter to sort of match the, the, the job that you want to, to have. And I think those, sorry, long answer. I think, no, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, because I think it's a very, very similar process, at least across the humanities. And I'm not sure the hard sciences, if there's something different to do here. I would say, especially if you compare it to Brazil, one thing that I, I haven't seen in the UK is uh, the public lecture in the sense that they ask you to teach something, which is something that they do in Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually they ask you to give a presentation, mm -hmm. but not a teaching, it's not necessarily a teaching moment. It's more, it's more like, give us a presentation about a topic of research, you know, a topic of research, um, or give us a presentation on your plans or, or your plans for a course that you wanna, that we want you to teach. And so they give you a prompt and say, you're gonna be teaching in, in this master's mm -hmm. course. How would you approach this topic? But not a public lecture in the traditional sense that we usually have in Brazil. So it's a little bit more laid back, I suppose, than preparing a whole thing. Um, in, in, usually in Brazil, they give you two days to prepare the teaching uh, experience, yeah. so it's not nice. Here is a little bit more laid back. I suppose in some some jobs that I have applied to, um, it was not open to the rest of the department. Actually, there there mm -hmm. were some some of those uh, talks that were just for the hiring committee. Mm -hmm. Some of those talks, like the one I gave here, were open to the whole faculty. So that you know, because there is no one way of doing that across the universities. Um, dates of that sometimes can change. I think more and more we are seeing the job posts coming with a component around EDI, the quality, diversity and inclusion, uh, especially in the humanities and social sciences. So I've, I've, I've worked on some job adverts like coming up for the universe for this faculty where we had a specific entry like you need to, you need proof or you need evidence that you been working towards a conclusion, equality, inclusion, and diversity, not because it's your area of expertise, but because you are aware of, of the concerns around that area. So even if you are in the chemistry department, you know, you, it would be good to have things to show for in terms of, of supporting equality, inclusion, and diversity. That's something that is becoming more and more important coming also top down from, from the government in terms of recruitment uh, in higher education. So it's always good to think about, you know, things that you've been doing, even outside, especially if you're not working directly in that area, thinking about, let's say, extracurriculars or, or things like that, 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 you can, that you can put in your CV as a way of showing that you are concerned. So for instance, facilitating events for your communities from the global south, like what we are doing, and that kind of thing, showing that you have this kind of connections and, and concerns, even in the traditional hard sciences is something incredibly mm -hmm. important. So I think that's something, especially for those who are still finishing their PhDs and then, you know, in that process, you still have time to, to think about how can you have something to show for, mm -hmm. of the kind of sensitivity to the topic. Yeah. Yeah. Please say thank you. Um, don't have any other questions. Do you have any questions? Sure. Uh, Very thorough. Information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Maria. It's a privilege to hear you uh, today because it's um, when I decided to apply for a, a postgraduate program here. I didn't know anything about how it worked, and it was like pure luck, I would say, because I, I just threw myself and <laughs> did it. Brave. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Mara um, brought something that uh, is very close to my heart, because um, I, I don't believe that um, it's not in my plans to stay in the UK after I finish my studies in here, and uh, I was uh, hearing uh, Tamara say, uh, talk about her experience going back to Brazil after uh, finishing her PhD here. And uh, I was thinking that's not something that I've been thinking about, how to manage, create, or keep networks and uh, build this transnational um, thing between UK academia and Brazilian academia, and even out of academia, uh, professional market, things like that. So uh, it's not like a question, it's more like, uh, what 
would you advise <laughs> or based on your experience because you're saying that your experience wasn't like all that you had like you you, you stood like for nine months looking for uh, a position and it's like it's interesting to learn from the difficulties yeah because you probably learned a lot <laughs> by that yeah, I, I think like that, that you know, it, it might, you, you might face a period of unemployment, which is what happened to me. So it's like, a, if you can prepare yourself for that financially and emotionally, it's, it, it's good. But, you know, obviously, if I, if I was to repeat uh, my, my trajectory, maybe like that last year of my PhD, I would have spent some of my time kind of uh, trying to build those, those networks, but I think I was very in doubt at that point if I wanted to come back or not. So perhaps that, it's very hard to aim for both markets because as I was saying, it's very different. Like I did a concurso in Brazil, which is what you have to do to get an academic position. And it's it's very different. Like you, you have to study for a test, for instance, like, um, so- Forgot about the tests. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's very different and, and and, um, and it's very hard if you if you're kind of like if your if your mind is set that you want to go back to Brazil, and you know more or less which which market you're aiming for. So yeah, perhaps spend some time uh, finding a bit more about that market. Like you know, I don't know LinkedIn. People use that these days. Like uh, try to approach people and 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 see if you can you know schedule a conversation. I think the pandemic. Uh, for us how to do things online. So it's not as kind of complicated now. They should say, oh, can we have a Zoom if you have time? Uh, so I think, you know, make 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 use of that um, and, and try to sort of learn a bit about what you did and think about your next steps and, and, and so on, because that's what I didn't do. I didn't think much about my next step. So I when I came back, I started kind of like, Okay, so now what do I do? I have to reset myself into academia, but I was coming from economics and now I was in geography, so I didn't have the networks that I had before were not as useful. Um, I mean, of course, they were still there and I, and I relied on them and, and it was important, but I, I had to kind of like get to know people that I didn't. Uh, but you will know some people and they will maybe be, be kind of like willing to, to sort of like find that the right connections but my, my advice would be spend some energy and some time uh, thinking about that and making some sort of like even if small steps towards a career that you know you want to have that um, if you if that's what you want because as I'm saying like you know sometimes you're like well what do I do and then it, your, your energy is a bit sort of like spread and then you can't really focus on anything but if your your mind is set on that i think yeah focus some energy some energy on that i suppose and i suppose that if you if your mind is set in that and that being academia not not something else outside academia um you can always make use of conferences uh, in the sense of you know getting to know brazilian scholars who are working in Brazil in conferences. Of course, you might not be doing a project about Brazil or any other country, but when you go to international conferences, you are always gonna find people from the countries where you wanna go, generally speaking. So if you wanna go back to Brazil or if you wanna go back, I don't know, to Hong Kong, or if you wanna go back to Chile, or if you wanna go back to the US, you are gonna find some of those scholars and you, you know, do the usual thing. You go and introduce yourself and you are nosy and you go, oh, you go and watch the person presentation. But that's something that you plan for in the sense that you don't do after you finish your PhD or in your final three months when you are running, you know, towards writing up and, and submitting. You do that as a building process of, you know, every conference you go. If you know that you are targeting, you know, perhaps that country, X, X country, then you would go and do your networking. I knew I was going to stay in the UK. So when I was going to conferences, I know I knew people here already, but I didn't know a lot. I knew my university. And then I went to international conferences. I was using the international conferences to actually get to know other people from the UK who were not in my traditional circle because I was targeting that. And, and 
don't want to say that I was ignoring people from Brazil because I was watching their presentation, but it's a different, it's, it's a different use of your energy in the sense of not spreading too much. You know? Because also, because you, if you want to stay in a country like this, with this level of internationalization, you also need to keep going with the networks in Brazil. So it, it, there is that, and I'm, I'm assuming that if you go back to Brazil, they will like to have you being able to say, I'm keeping my networks. And so, yeah, for sure. You need to plan and I mean, where, where to put your efforts in that sense. I, I completely agree. I mean, having that kind of, I started putting myself out there, even in this country before my, in my third year, let's say, because they using the conferences, being nosy, using conferences, using events like this to put myself a little bit out there. And, and, and there is a lot of personal marketing involved. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and get your, uh, uh, what they call elevator pitch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Explain your thesis in three minutes. You need to be good at that. Right? Yeah. You can talk about that in the conferences. This is who I am. Can I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> um, well, it's about the navigating the system, which we already know that's quite different from Brazil. In Brazil, after the PhD is quite straightforward. You do a PhD and you have a diploma and you start to study for this uh, tests yeah. and try to be a um, um, professor at the university or if you want to do research uh, you probably want to try a private sector because as you previously said it you can't do only research inside the university you still have to have a little bit of teaching uh, I understand that you for example both have different um, professions in here, different job roles uh, uh, you mentioned that you're a lecturer, you mentioned that you are an assistant professor, and before you were um, a research fellow. A fellow, yes. So, uh, what are the pathways after you finish your PhD in here? In this country. In this country. So many. I, I think that's the fascinating thing that actually. I knew what I wanted to say, but, I, but here you have so many possibilities. <laughs> degree that perhaps do not exist in Brazil at the same level. So I work in science education and there, there are a lot of charities for instance, in the UK around, let's say, girls participation in science, minority groups participation in science. And those research degrees, they actually count for institutions and like that. In Brazil, we wouldn't, even when we have those kinds of institutions like NGOs and charities, not all of them value a doctoral degree. We need to go for the undergrad or the masters. But here, because the competition uh, for jobs in those kinds of charities, NGOs, for instance, is very high. So there, there is, there is um, a market for those with a PhD to go to that kind of sector instead of staying in academia. So I would flag that something that is very different, I suppose, to my experience in Brazil. That is, a, is an extra thing that is not very prevalent. Um, so I think going to that kind of charity NGO kind of sector is a massive, is a big possibility, especially not only, but especially if you are doing humanities and social sciences, you're dealing with people, you know how to deal with people, you have the research skills related to working with people, like interviewing, doing ethnographies, doing documentary analysis, all those methodological skills and quantitative skills as well, but in the social sciences level, they are really, really good for, for that kind of job. And this is in and I'm thinking here, not just traditional ways of thinking about NGOs and charities, but also let's say museums, you know, in the IK, museum science centers, and they, they really like because they do a lot of internal research. So they do a lot of internal research and those skills that we bring with, doctoral, with a doctoral degree are very relevant to them. So I think that would be a pathway that I find very interesting and very different. And I think I was torn for a long time between staying in academia in that traditional sense that we are, and we're going to that angle because it would allow me to work even more with people. Um, we have postdoctoral fellowships as well. Going a little bit back to the funders that Mara was talking about, you can apply to a postdoctoral uh, position either directly at the university or you can do something. Sometimes the university has a postdoctoral position and you apply for it as, a, as it would be for a job. Sometimes you can apply yourself. You can come up with a project yourself, just get the support from one university, but you would do the whole process yourself with some of those funders. They have different avenues for that. 
and universities with research centers, uh, like we have here, for instance, in this faculty, we have some research centers. They usually have a lot of a lot of positions for very early career um, scholars, like right after their PhDs or towards the end of their final, towards the end of their PhD, that they call research assistants or research fellows. Uh, so that's a, a, not all of them are permanent position. They are usually project based positions. Uh, to do a specific kind of job and they do, do not choose necessarily there's, there's a project they got some funding like a large project they need someone for the data collection um, that is an extremely helpful way to get experience in, in in research that is not just your project that is research so trying to speak the language of other projects not just yours so getting out of your bubble and, and talking to other people about other projects. In my final year of my PhD, I had a post as a research assistant. It was not full time, it's more post, just helping with a project. And that gave me a little bit more of networking because I was not just networking my project, but networking. So research assistants and research fellows are other positions that are very common here, really usually associated with specific centers, research centers or specific big life scale projects. I think they're a very good way of getting experience. That was my first, those were my first two jobs before I got a permanent lectureship. And then, and then you have those positions that mix research with teaching, which are the more traditional ones in Brazil as well. Yeah. Any other? And I, I just, uh, just one comment is just like the, the thing about the system, uh, lecture and assistant professors actually the same thing. Oh, they're all the it's same. Because oh, uh, right. in the UK, it used to be lecture, in it's like lecture, reader, and a professor. Mm -hmm. Assistant professor is actually an American term. Yes. That the UK system is increasingly adopted. Yes. Because they love the American system yes. and love hiring <laughs> Americans. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the, the only I, I, the, the thing that I wanted to say, which is not super positive, I think, her, her kind of like response was more, more positive that depending on the field you are the, the competition is, is insane you know like uh, I just had you know my own experience of like trying to hire a, a tutor to give seminars which is you know a job that I would only apply for if I was a PhD student because that's where you find like experience and for teaching, for teaching and it's important to do those kinds of jobs research assistant uh, uh, teaching assistant why you're doing your PhD because you know you can have a track record in your CV later on uh, and also find out if you want the job of becoming a, a teacher because when, once you become a lecturer you're going to be doing research admin and teaching all at the same time so sort of like finding out if you like all those bits of the job I think is important uh, but anyways I was telling the story and then I got like applications from people who already had you know finished the PhDs, had even postdocs, and I was a bit surprised, but not so much knowing that, you know, that the situation uh, in, in, in this country, in several universities, is one of kind of like increased precarity in the sector, which is um, um, not, not great news, but, you know, so there are other, a lot of opportunities, but there are a lot of people out there as well. And, and sometimes, you know, you're going to go through periods in which you're going to have, you know, a sort of like part-time job, a fixed term project that you're working on. And, and it's, it's not easy. Like, it's very rare to go from your PhD to a lectureship, like, straight away. In general, you're going to go through a period in which you're kind of like jumping uh, a bit in between jobs. Um, and I guess it's, it's important to kind of like accept that a bit. But keep your your research, you know, keep your uh, independent project, because once you're going to apply for, for a lectureship, they are interested in someone who has promise, who has potential. So if you're jumping from one, one job, one project to the next, and you don't keep your sort of coherence in your trajectory, that's going to show in your CV and academia is very, very unforgiving sometimes. So, um, I would say so, sort of like, yeah, you know, it, there's going to be bumps, <laughs> bumps along the way, but, you know, publish from your PhD, do, do the things that, that you have to do. But, you know, it, that said, I'm not like a true believer in meritocracy. I don't think it's, you know, up to the individual. There are structural kind of 
uh, uh, issues that are sort of constraining our access to positions and so on. But you know, there are things you can do to, to position yourself within a system to facilitate your, your access to you know, what I think everyone wants, which is a, some sort of a certain job, a certain position that you can come. Uh, and we can talk more, you know, afterwards. Uh, but, but that's a very good point because it's all, I mean, comparing that, that is, you know, that's something that is very prevalent when we were talking about Mara, it's very prevalent in the UK, the precarity, the fixed term, you work by hours or you work by months and that's it, you have three months and that's it. That is getting to Brazil. That is more and more prevalent in Brazilian academia as well. We, we used to have a system that it was that was a lot more stable in terms of hiring, in terms of getting those contracts and being in those contracts being stable. That 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 process that, it, that we know here in the UK to be very prevalent is happening in Brazil as mm -hmm. well. So that 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 and not just in Brazil, in, in a lot of higher education systems across the world, there is of course there there are a lot of there are different structures behind all of that and we don't have to get into the academic side of all of this the academic i mean the theoretical side of all of this but be careful with brazil as well and in other countries because that is getting there and i mean i have friends and it's not it's not very different from from your experience but i have friends who stayed in brazil they did their phds in brazil they finish in the top universities in the country and they are still applying for jobs and they are doing their odd jobs, their odd participation in projects. And they, mm -hmm. they know the system, they've been there, they, they have a lot of publications, conferences, but the competition is so, so, so large. <laughs> and the system is being made into the non-stable positions as well now that they are doing, you know, the teaching, they are teaching jobs for universities for like three months to cover maternity leave. It's just the teaching, it's just two days a week and that's all and you, you no just get time. No, no research time, no benefits from, from the state system, nothing. So that is something that is spreading across the world. And it's very good to, to be aware of that when you are playing that game, you know, play the mm. game of all these structural issues because um you need to consider if that's what you want to do to keep doing and i thinking about planning you know you're, you you are going to go through a moment to a period of instability so you have to plan for that because even if you are in your home country where you have you know the networks that you might need family around you that is this, that is very prevalent across the world and 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 it is a challenge. It's a new challenge, perhaps, when you compare to 20 years ago or mm. 15 years ago in Brazil mm. or here. So. Mm. Enjoy the union. Uh, well. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, one of the few things that are still around <laughs> for protection. I think that's very important. Just <laughs> um, so we do have time for one last question. Mm -hmm. Question. So um, it's more about. Um, do you find it very difficult when you go back to Brazil and then apply for a job in the UK? Is there like any um, universities preferring people already in the country? Uh, yeah, that's that's a good point because you know not all not all universities, not all positions will be sort of uh, able to sponsor your visa. Um, so I think like you know in my case, I I was in Brazil, but I had kept the contacts here and I was applying for to my my old job kind of like not my old job but a job at my old university and I think the the fact that you know they knew me and it was a position again like it, it depends on the field you're you're in because I am a scholar working on urbanization in the global south so there are positions I apply for generally I'm going to compete with international people anyway it's not to say that there are no international uh, uh, home scholars doing research, but, you know, in general, those positions will be more open to international uh, scholars because, you know, that's the crowd you're kind of aiming for. So I think it depends on the job. Obviously, if you're applying, for instance, for a short-term contract, very rarely will they be able to uh, But if you're applying for a sort of like more long-term position, uh, mo um, the majority of the universities will be able to, to, to sponsor a visa. And I mean, I don't think I've had, because I mean, I'm always on a work visa. So the, the jobs that I had here, um, I didn't feel at any point that I was, um, let's say kind of like 
overlooked or it's because of that. Um, um, so yeah, the, the, the UK, they, they are very good at sort of like, you know, they, they want the, the best, not saying that that's me, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they will go for it. Yeah. And if they have the, the, the resources to sponsor a visa, they will. So, uh, but if you're looking for jobs outside academia, then I think it becomes a bit more complicated because academia in the UK is a very international kind of sector anyways, uh, but other kinds of professions are not so much and companies will uh, have to have a certain degree of kind of an internal organization to be able to sponsor a visa. Right. And they are sometimes lazy. That's the word, like they won't like to find out and kind of have the expertise in place to sponsor a visa. It's not even about money sometimes, it's just about, you know, navigating uh, a system that well, us as migrants have to learn how to navigate, but, you know, the companies will not do it. So um, I think it depends. I mean, the, my, my answer, it depends. In academia, most kind of longer term positions will have, uh, will not sort of, you know, discriminate against international um, applicants. Um, I mean, obviously, if you have the credentials, right, <laughs> because, because they will not, it's very hard for someone applying from an international country that has never been from the UK system to be considered for a position, unless they come from the US, then it's fine. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I guess that's my, I don't know if you have I agree, anything. I agree. I think with these short-term contracts, I've been panels for short-term contracts for specific yeah. projects. They are not going to sponsor a work visa for that because it even meet, it doesn't meet the threshold for working exactly. visas and for, from the government. It's not that they don't necessarily have the expertise to navigate. Like yeah. you said, it's a very international academia, so they know how to handle those things. Thanks, Theresa May. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they know how to handle that, but but usually that's more common than actually long-term contracts. Just a short question: What is a short-term contract, and what is what configure? Short term, I think, like anything, anything uh, under a year, yes, um, I think would be yeah. considered short term, and especially because usually for those short term contracts, they need it, they need you to start very soon, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the process of applying for the visa, etc., even if they want you, yeah. it's not going to allow you to be there doing the data collection next week or the week after, so that, that is usually the, the problem. So anything under a year means that possibly something that they want mm -hmm. a quick turnaround of, of the person working though in that contract and the bureaucracy with the work visa is it's very difficult to, to speed up. So I would still apply though, you know, because mm -hmm. never and, and it's an yeah. experience and it's a good experience yeah. of the system because it's not that different. I mean, depend what well, depends on the field, etc. But it's not the difference from applying to a person in terms of no. composing your CV, composing so yeah. that experience, and even you know, they might invite you to the interview. Yeah. So I've I've been a panel where we had an amazing candidate, but we needed the person to start two weeks later, and so we, we couldn't offer because um, they were coming from a country who needed a visa. But we got to know that candidate and, and the candidate came and invited because we thought the candidate was so amazing, so we're such an interesting person, we want to hear more about it because then we can keep that in mind if there, the project extends and then you can mm -hmm. offer something in the future. Because it's not like the bureaucracy that we have in some countries in terms of procedure like Brazil, you can do that kind of stuff here in terms of keeping a name in mind for next time. If you're opening something later and you remember that person from that application that didn't pay out because of visa problems, you can always send a message, oh, don't you want to apply for this now? That this looks, mm -hmm. this is going to be longer. So that kind of thing, putting it, it, it's part of putting yourself out there as well. Um, how is this different from applying for a for a PhD? Uh, because I'm I'm studying master's degree in Mexico. Uh, I'm here because I just 
came like two days ago and I found the event and I say, okay. That's the putting yourself out there. <laughs> uh, and um, I feel like a kind of uh, relief because the, the field that I want to study, uh, it's like completely new in Mexico. Well, not new, it doesn't exist in Mexico. Uh, I, I'm studying Asian African studies, but I want to study Mongolia. So there's nothing in Mexico about that. That's why I'm here, I came to read. Um, I, I, I won a grant and I said, okay, I'm going. So I, I think that the only way that I can continue studying or researching is like, getting out of Mexico. There is no other way I, I, I can find it. So how this uh, is different, how um, do you think that the, the situation is for, for scholars, from international scholars who doesn't have this background or that are changing? I'm, I'm, I am an anthropologist. So maybe I, it's not like a big change, but I used to study like indigenous in, in Mexico or something in, in there. How do you think that it, it can affect uh, or be different? When you are applying for a PhD. Uh -huh. and so, I mean, the first thing you, you need to know is find out who you're gonna work with. Uh -huh. um, you know, who is the, is the person that, or I mean, so, there are different possibilities. You can sort of like start studying like departments that have, you know, anthropology departments and be like, okay, this person could be in. Email them, make sure to make the email personal. I can't stress that enough yes. because I have, I receive various emails of people who want to work with me, who spell my name wrong, who, you know, I'm not like a, you know, a vaidosa, let's say, I don't know how to say it in English. But you know, if you if you can't even spell my name right, I'm I'm. It starts from there. That kind of like I'm like, oh, this person didn't do the homework. So do your well homework, research uh, uh, anthropology departments, find out people that could you could work with, take a look at their CVs, find out like a bit about their work, so you can write an email that will stand up yeah. from the hundreds of emails, not hundreds, but. <laughs> you, get, you get when you know the, the PhD kind of application process is open. Okay. Uh, and then you know if you find someone that will reply to you and that will be nice to you because you want someone that's nice mm -hmm. to be your PhD yes. supervisor. Uh, and then you start to develop a project together with that person and then you're going to have to identify a potential kind of source for funding which might be in the ESRC, uh, again, like the landscape that we were talking about. Uh, generally speaking, universities, you know, some universities have their own scholarships, uh, but again, competitive. <laughs> so, you know, you might have to work towards applying for, for a scholarship, which is uh, funded by a different kind of uh, funding body with your supervisor uh, and, you know, that process can, can take a bit long. And, you know, uh, one thing that I was going to say that I forget, like when you apply for academic jobs, one thing that you have to get used to is rejection. <laughs> uh, no, you know, it, it will happen. And, and it's not personal, you know. Like, uh, so, you know, find out how, who you can work with, start researching the possible funders, um, and then, yeah, develop a project that, you know, strong enough that you can um, get where you want to be. And I, I was working, like, I had one, um, one student and that we just got a scholarship for him and I was so excited and I've never been so excited in my life when I found out that we got it because it's a student from India that approached me that way, sending an email that I first ignore and then he emailed again. And then I was like, okay, I was, I'm gonna look at your PDF. And then it was a great proposal. And I was like, oh, this guy is serious actually. And then I worked with him to apply for a scholarship and he's gonna start now in October. So, you know, things happen, but it takes time, it takes effort. It takes someone nice like me. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think that goes, yeah, I mean, that, that 
possibly your experience. That was my experience applying for your PhD as well. And I think, you know, finding the right supervisor and dedicating yourself to finding the right supervisor mm -hmm. in that sense of, you know, not spelling their name, <laughs> not saying that they work with language education when they work with science education and things like that. So all those, that kind of, that stands out as the same thing with a job application, right? You study the job advert, you study the department and you come up with an application that fits. The PhD is the same. And I think one of the things that I, we both mentioned a little bit in terms of coming here to do the PhD is the networks, you know, people who know people who can who can also help. Of course, if, sometimes you don't know anyone and that should not prevent you from applying. I have students who, who apply to work with me as, doctor, as my doctoral students who found me because they were looking for someone in the faculty. They wanted to come here. And it, so we didn't have any connections. So should not prevent you from applying, not having the connections. But one thing that can give you connections are networks like this group behind the organization of the event today. Or we have here in the faculty, we have the, the Latin American collective uh, in this faculty, for instance. So you can approach those networks of students, student unions, students collectives. They might be able to help. I know they are able to help because they, I know they've been helping. Uh, and they can give, if you don't know any scholars or any of their professors, you can um, approach those networks of students. I suppose I'm, I'm not. I just wanted to flag that because I know that's something that you that is part of what you want to do with with the with the Brazilian society and, and that and that we have so many others in here because it's such an international landscape uh, in higher education in this country that that's how we get to we get to know other students you can uh, in a way network with that that angle as well um, if you feel it's too daunting to to find the right scholar out of nowhere those these kinds of networks can be extremely helpful and then we are here to support your work as well. But even before applying, I think that would be a good way of even to know the university. You know, sometimes you think, oh, this is an amazing department, and then you talk to people not necessarily <laughs> right. So and that's real. That is real. I mean, that's real. There are so many things I thought about one or two places in this country, and then when you talk to people about it, oh, it's not like that, you know, and it's good to, to know before you apply. So those networks can be helpful. Thank you so much. We gave so much information <laughs> and a lot to think about. I, don't know if I was just going to say that if people want to message me, if they spell my name right, I will answer. <laughs> it's a pleasure to, to, to help. Um, and, and if I can help with anything else, I'm always happy to, to apply. Um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, just thank you for the invite and for the opportunity to, to, to speak to this um, crowd and to answer questions. And also, I'm open to answering anything if you spell my name correct. It's not Maria, it's Mara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks, Beatrice. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.